cloud. All right, Adam, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I appreciate you making some time. Could you start by maybe giving everybody a, a brief intro of who you are and, and what you've done? Yeah. So my name is Adam Kaler from Cincinnati. Always been here, West Side, Best Side. I've done a lot of different things. I guess I'm a, a jack of all trades, master of none. And I get bored really easily. So I bounce between things like so many people, right? Especially entrepreneur types. I think we, if you've ever done your Myers-Briggs, I did mine. I'm an ENTP, if anybody's familiar with that. But we are very much folks who can't really focus on one thing. We like to move around, experience different things, do different things. And I'm guessing there's a big chunk of your listener base right now that's probably in the same boat. But I also run a podcast. You're on, you were on my podcast, Side Hustle City. Yep. I think we're up to about 170 episodes or so right now. But one of the big things for me is helping other people become entrepreneurs. That's my goal is to help particularly the city of Cincinnati. And I bring on people from all different kinds of backgrounds, people that overcame different odds, people that had ideas and decided to do something about those ideas and just use that as motivation. And maybe it sparks something in people and they say, hey, that, that sounds like something I could do. And they, they do something because it's only going to benefit everyone. Right. When more people start small businesses, we have more jobs, it helps our economy, et cetera, et cetera. So I do that. And our guests are from all over the world. So it's not just people from Cincinnati, but mostly Cincinnati people listen to it. In my past, I have been an entrepreneur for the last oh, 13, 14 years, I would say. I started out as a graphic designer, web designer. I got into buying real estate, been owning real estate for actually 25 years. And got up to probably 11 houses. I never got super crazy into residential real estate. My tenants were terrible people <laughs> for the most part and just tore all my stuff up. And you rent to them for a year, you make a hundred bucks a month, and then they do $10,000 worth of damage when they leave. Yeah, I had those kind of situations. And I still do have some real estate, but that actually led me because I had a marketing design background and I was buying real estate. That actually led me into starting a company called Dot Loop which a friend yeah. of mine, Austin Allison, he was working with another friend of mine at the time, Matt Vorst, who was a developer. And Austin had this idea to essentially eliminate the fax machine in the real estate industry. Because you remember these days, a lot of your younger guests won't remember or listeners won't remember, but we used to have to fax our documents from one real estate agency to another real estate agency. So right. if you wanted to buy a house, you met with a real estate agent, you filled out a bunch of paper, they drove back to their real estate office and put that sheet in a fax machine and sent it over to the seller's agent, which the seller's agent was never there, right? So then you would wait two or three days for the seller's agent to get back to the office, find that sheet of paper, take it physically to the seller, and then they would mark it up send it back. And that could have happened three or four times. That sheet looked like crap after four or five yeah. generations of going yeah. through that fax machine. So we essentially eliminated that. We created a digital documents system called Dotloop. And it, I think maybe 90% of real estate agents of the country are using, or at least signed up for it. I don't think they're using it, but 40% uh, of them, I think were using it when we sold. And we had processed about $2 trillion worth of transactions. Wow. Uh, before we sold the company, had hundreds of employees. We were doing millions a year in revenue. And Zillow came around a couple times, actually, and wanted to buy us after we did a, uh, a venture round. And one thing led to the other. We ended up selling the company. We were in business for, I don't know, six years at that point. We started like 2009. And I was just the graphic designer. I, I was in the office below Dot Loop's offices at Longworth Hall. Not, I don't know if everybody's familiar with Longworth Hall. But Dot Loop took over like the fourth and fifth floors of Longworth Hall at one point. And I was down on the third floor. I was still running my advertising agency. And Alex Allison, Austin's brother, would come down and ask me for stuff all the time. Several of the other employees, like whenever they were doing a big marketing thing, come down and ask me for stuff every once in a while. But yeah, we all did pretty well. A lot of our employees had stock options. They all they went off and started their own companies. And this is the beauty of entrepreneurship. You start a company, you have people that were early in that company, they make money. They go off and start their own companies. There's probably been six or seven successful businesses that have come out of Dot Loop since then. Most of them in real estate. A couple of them I know off the top of my head that are in um, short-term rentals. Uh, a couple that are in sales training. 
So it, it was pretty wild. Most of our employees were salespeople and I would say tech ser like service people that people would call us and say, hey, my computer isn't working. You say, have you tried to turn it on? So we're, <laughs> we're more like, it wasn't just Dot Loop that we were helping them with. It was like their computer problems too, is what it sounded right. like. But yeah, I was just downstairs and in Austin and Matt, and a few of the other guys, they were essentially running the company and it all worked out for us. Helping out early with a business, getting it off the ground. First, probably 18 months, we were spending almost every weekend working on the thing. When Austin was raising money and finding office space for us and busting our butts, company probably almost died two or three times. We had to go back and do more follow-up rounds and everybody got to appreciate or all of our money seemed to be going away <laughs> every time we raise another round. But one thing led to another, it worked out for everybody. Austin has gone off and started his company, Picasso, which is, I think the fastest startup to a billion dollar valuation in history at the time. Wow. Yeah. They, like a $1.6 billion valuation. They raised their last round at. So he's doing well. Amazing. Yeah. His brother, Alex has started a business, D Alexander, which was doing well. A couple of our other guys, they went out and started businesses. It works out. So that's one thing I did. And then I, I own a commercial real estate, I own a, a co-working space here in Covington, Kentucky. We rent this out, 20,000 square foot building. Uh, it's commercial commercial kitchen, co-working space. And then we're, we're working on an event center upstairs. And then I still own my ad agency. So we're doing well with that, among other things, rental properties, et cetera. You never, you never let the ad agency go or did you restart it under a new brand or? Oh, no, the, it's been around since 2009. I finally turned into an LLC, probably 2011. But yeah, man, I was running that while at the same time I was freelancing at agencies. So I was actually working full time at an agency when I started that. And that was around the same time we we're doing dot loop. So I'm doing dot loop. I'm working pretty much full time in an ad agency with Matt Forst, one of our co-founders. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got looped into dot loop. And I was doing freelance at the same time. Most graphic designers are, are freelancers as well. And this is how we right. uh, supplement our pathetic incomes that we make from these ad agencies we work for. So <laughs> right. it's a good industry to be in. Honestly, there's a handful of things that you could do. That you can have a full-time job and you could freelance at copywriting, graphic design, any kind of dev work, all those things. And people approach you with ideas sometimes, like they did me with Dot Loop, said, Hey, we'll give you some equity if you help us do this or that. And sometimes it works out. Majority of the time it probably doesn't, but you get lucky and you find some good co-founders like like I did. And it, it's well worth the the time. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's actually how you and I got first introduced because Maher and I were, we had just been admitted to Centrifuge, I think, and they recommend it for Needle. <clears throat> and I think it was Mark over there recommended that we get in touch with you. And we reached out and you were very enthusiastic and you're like, yeah, definitely. And we got on the podcast, I think at the end of August, maybe. Oh yeah. And yeah, that was when we, that was when we officially started letting people know what we're doing. Cause honestly, for so long, it was something that we kept under our hat because it's, you don't, I don't know. You, you Nobody's want... going to be able to recreate what you guys did. The technology or oh, nah, the technology he built, it's too good. Yeah. And what got me excited about what you guys were doing is I really want Cincinnati and I'm right now I'm running for County commission. I want to talk about that later too. Yeah. What so talk about my, now. Oh, my big thing, just why I mentioned that is because I want the economy of Cincinnati to do better. And I also want the startup community to do better. It's been, I don't know. I feel like there's not as much excitement around startups in Cincinnati. There used to be when we did dot loop, like it was new. Everybody was pumped up about it. There was money kind of flooding in. People had tons of ideas. They wanted to get out of their jobs. And now people in Cincinnati, you got the golden handcuff problem, right? You got a lot of people who are smart, but they're working at a place like Proctor or one of the banks, or they don't necessarily have to do anything. They're, they got that comfy, cushy job. They're getting stock options. And there's just not a lot of great support. There is support, but there's not a lot of people that are wanting to go out and do it. And then you guys were, but I want Cincinnati to have a niche in the startup thing, right? We're not Silicon Valley, right? We're not, yeah. we're not going to be the AI capital of the world. We're not going to be the social media place. We're not going to be like that. You have to find your niche if you have, if you're in a region, right? Every city has its own startup community and you have your benefits, right? You have things that you're naturally good at. For us, I think it's real estate. We've got momentum when it comes to real estate technology. Yeah. 
we got a lot of, believe it or not, we got a lot of big time syndicators here that people don't even really know about. They've been on my podcast. They've got millions and millions, some of them billions in real estate. Some of the bigger pockets guys are here. Dot Loop, obviously. OcuCell is another startup here locally that is in the real estate space. You guys with Needle, there we could make a case for if you have a real estate startup, you should come to Cincinnati and you should post yep. up. Here. And if we could have a couple more real estate exits, you guys in OcuCell, you sell for a billion dollars, that all of a sudden brings attention, right, to the area. Plus logistics outside of just real estate. I think logistics is a, a space that we could definitely say we could compete in. Yeah. I know that like med tech, but you got Cleveland Clinic up the road, right? Cleveland could argue the same thing. When it comes to fintech, Charlotte could say with Bank of America, they could say, hey, we're the fintech capital. What does Cincinnati say? Well, we got Fifth Third Bank. They've got Bank of America, which is much bigger. So, and Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo. So it's, yeah. So it's like, why would Cincinnati compete in those spaces when there's already significant momentum in other places? Logistics, supply chain, that stuff in Cincinnati makes sense. Real estate, we've already got some momentum there. Let's roll with that. So when I heard about you guys, I was like, this is perfect. And it's in the commercial space too, which yeah. I don't think there's enough in the commercial space, honestly. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a factor of commercial real estate in and of itself. It's um, very much kind of a, uh, for me, breaking in, it was so tough to get in because unless your family's got a couple hundred or a couple thousand units, stay out sort of thing. But yeah, and commercial real estate in particular, I think has been, because of that, I think has been so slow to adopt new technologies. Yeah, honestly, we're trying to we're trying to do big things. We had a working session this morning for about three four hours, and we've got another one tomorrow. So wow. we're trying to fine tune it and just be as creative as we can. So I guess on that, like when you guys were building Dot Loop, what were some of the challenges that you had to face and overcome that? seemed insurmountable, but you're like, man, we can get through this. It's just well, going to take some I, work. The good thing is we had Austin and Austin didn't take no for an answer. So there was, I will tell you, it's the industry. That was the big challenge. From what I remember early on, it was the Cincinnati Board of Realtors didn't like us because they were literally selling stacks of paper. Like those contracts were, right. they were selling those, right? right? I can't remember how much they were, but it was like, they didn't want to lose money selling their stacks of paper, right? And if you were a real estate agent, you could, you owned that contract, really. So you could do whatever you want with it. If you want to digitize it, you could digitize it, right? And that's, they didn't want us. Then we had some other big real estate brokerages here in Cincinnati that tried to create their own version of Dot Loop. We went and talked to them. Austin went and talked to them. And they sounded interested, but I think they were just trying to get info from us so that they could try to build it. But nobody, no other broker wants to use another broker software. If they want to plaster their name on it, it's I don't want to use that. That's another brokerage. So you needed a third party like Dot Loop to do it. So it was, we didn't care who you were. We were just going to do our job and nothing funny was going to happen. But you did have some that were trying to like digitize their own contracts and thought that would make a difference, but nobody else wanted to use their version of a digital contract. So that was a challenge. And plus, most of the people that were sending faxes, all these faxes, most of the people that do a lot of business in real estate are the older people, the older agents. The younger agents yeah. don't have a lot of business, right? Yeah. These older agents, and these people were 60s, 70s, some of them, they didn't want to change the way they worked, right? right. They were like, oh, this fax machine thing, this works out. I know it works, but it takes freaking forever. And I use tons of paper, but to them it worked. And I'd say in real estate, 90% of the business is done by 10% of the agents. It's not even 80-20, it's 90-10. Yeah, and most right. of those agents are older and getting them to switch over to a new technology, complete pain in the butt. And so you had that problem, a big problem, right? And we solved that when Keller Williams adopted Dot Loop. So we were trying to sell to individual real estate agents. And you had all these individual real estate agents that, no, nah, I don't want to use it. Who are you guys? Dot Loop. I've never heard of you. No, no, thanks. This is a good strategy, I would say for any startup, enterprise kind of sales is where it's at because you need to legitimize yourself quickly 
If you can't legitimize yourself and the way to legitimize yourself is to get a big customer that everybody else knows about, right? And so when Keller Williams signed up, I think they had 80,000 agents at the time, and we met them at a conference. Austin met them at a conference, talked to one of their executives. It took, I don't know, maybe a year or something to actually patch everything that we had into their e-transaction system, but 80,000 agents, just like that, out of overnight. the million yeah. agents. Yeah, overnight, like out of the million agents that were floating around at the time. So you got 80,000 agents, 85% of those agents, I think the number was, I'm thinking back years now, but I think 85% of agents or 85% of the business that agents do is with another brokerage. Sure. It's not inner brokerage. It's not Keller Williams to Keller Williams. So, you know, when another agent was like, Hey, let me fax that over to you or let, let I'll wait for your fax. The Keller Williams agent, the Keller Williams agent was like, no, we got this e-transactions platform and we've got this e-signatures part to it, this dot loop thing. Just sign up for dot loop. We don't have to mess with the fact. So they became our salespeople. Yeah. So think about that. What if you've got a startup out there and you've got if you were trying to gain adoption or whatever, that's our story. That's how it went from what I remember. This was years ago, but I, I just what remember year, that what being year the was this in 2011? That would have probably been 2011, maybe yeah, 2011. Yeah, probably 2011. Okay. Something awesome. like that. Wow. So yeah, that was that was the big thing and go to shows. Go to industry shows. Go to shows that aren't necessarily industry related, but they're parallel industries. Maybe if you went to a home and garden show, that's not necessarily real. Like it is real estate related, but it's not a real estate show where you're going to have tons of competition. I like to go to the adjacent type of shows, right? But that was NAR. That was the National Association of Realtors Conference, and Austin. He we didn't have much money in the bank, and he spent practically all of it on that show. He was just all eggs, just put it all in, all the cards on the table, all the money in, right? It was a big gamble, but it worked out. I changed the entire company and kept going. And we got to make this work. Got to make it work. Yep. And we had the car from Back to the Future, the DeLorean. was. We got one of the best spaces in the entire show and had yeah. the DeLorean there. So everybody's coming up, taking pictures with the DeLorean, right? Mm -hmm. And then obviously they're going to ask about Dot Loop. And it seemed like we had tons of backing, tons of money because we had nice graphics. I did all these graphics for the show. And we, we had the car there. We were in a great spot. So everybody was like, oh, these guys must be killing it. And sometimes you just got to fake it till you make it. Sure. Yeah. hundred percent. Wow. That's awesome, man. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. So that was, that's what did it for us. I think thinking back on it now. And then obviously a lot of us learned a lot from that whole process. I was out of it after the initial build and all that other stuff because I was running the agency. I was doing a lot of other stuff too. So we brought on like a graphic design. Austin brought a graphic designer in to help with a lot of that day-to-day -day stuff. Matt was killing it. You'll never find a dude. You've got one right now that's working for equity. <laughs> Mayor is, is doing it, right? Yeah. But it's so hard for a startup to find a guy like Mayor, like Matt Vorst, who's willing to spend as much time developing the product to get it going into when Keller Williams says, jump, you got to jump. You got to make your changes. You got to do this. You got to do that. And we were also blessed because we worked at a digital agency, me and Matt. So we knew a lot of people and we could help bring on those early employees that knew how to do that, the, the hard stuff. And Austin knew a bunch of guys that were young and hungry and were ready to do sales that he grew up with. And you also, you got to find attractive people because then they go to the shows and people want to talk to them. <laughs> And that works. I'm telling you, it's weird, but it works. Yep. And it's just human nature, right? It's just people want to be around people like that. You know, I found a bunch of young people that realtors wanted to come up and talk to. And we went to a bunch of shows and one thing led to the other. We just, you know, you just build on it, right? You go to one show, you go to another show. And before you know it, people are familiar with you. They they know your name. It takes a couple of times of exposure, but then once they, oh, okay. Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah. Huh. It's a small industry. It's not, there's yeah. one and a half million realtors now. So if you've got a startup and you're going after a market, that it's crazy because that's not even, we didn't even have to niche down really because the market was already small enough, right? right? Our target market was already small enough. Just like you, you're niche down inside of real estate. So how many, you probably know the math on this or you know the numbers, but how many commercial real estate agents are there out of all the real estate agents how many are actually doing commercial it's in our pitch deck but i think it's i want to say it's thirty thousand. 
30,000 that you got to sell. Yeah. That's wild. And then if you can get them to start using it, they're going to get all their clients to use it because it's predictive. It's yeah. predicting, hey, I'm thinking about maybe putting my building on the market. What would it be worth? Here you go. So let's help you figure that out. Right. You know? Yeah, I was actually blown away at what you guys were doing. That's it's really interesting. And the kind of everything in real estate is driven by data. Real estate agents are in their computers all day looking at data and stuff. And this is providing them. If you're a commercialist, you'd be like stupid not to use this. Honestly, you're going to get left behind if you're not using it. It's just it's crazy. And if another agent shows your client needle and what it can do they're not going to be your client very much long, like very long because they're going to go, why don't you know about this thing? It's just like yeah. dot loop. Nobody wanted the fact stuff. Nobody wanted to wait five or six days for another real estate agent to get a piece of paper back over to them. Like it just didn't make any sense. Plus they had to have, they had to warehouse all that paper. It was crazy. Right. Like file cabinets. You remember those days, file cabinets worth. Just I have crazy. one left over. <laughs> yeah, but you had to hold on to that stuff too. Yeah. When I got dot loop, it keeps track of all your stuff. And, and it was like a CRM. It did a lot of stuff for people. And we tried a couple of different things, like jump into some other, not really verticals, but different aspects, recommendations for contractors when you bought your house and stuff like that. It just didn't really work out. Like an Angie's List. We had a partnership with Angie's List. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So we, you know, all we had to do is go over to Indianapolis. It wasn't that far, but yeah, fun little stuff like that. And Things work out, things don't work out. But at the end of the day, uh, some people think we sold a little early, especially our VCs. <laughs> I think they weren't too thrilled because they wanted to 10x their money or whatever. Uh, so but, can you talk about that process at all? You said that Zillow and maybe some other suitors showed up and you turned them away. Like, what does that look like? Because Well, that was really Austin making those decisions. But yeah. but yeah, from what I remember, Zillow came a couple times. And offered us some money and Austin just was like, ah, I don't think this is the right time. And then they came through. And I think the reason Zillow really wanted to buy us. Now, this is a good point for anybody who's got a startup. Um, I think they wanted to buy us because we had such strong adoption in the real estate industry. Right. And people liked Dot Loop. Real estate agents liked using Dot Loop. And I don't think they liked Zillow very much because it was a no. pay to play. Yeah. And I Zillow came through because I think they they wanted to buy friends in a way and buy adoption it, because look, what did they own? They own the search, right? If you already own the search, why wouldn't you also want to own the contract? Sure. So they wanted to own more of the process, like keep people in your ecosystem. So you already had 90% of real estate agents signed up to use it. 40%, I think, were actually using Dot Loop on a regular basis. So that's a lot. That's you know over a half a million realtors using your stuff for their transactions. So now you know people are searching on Zillow and they could sign a contract on Dot Loop. So the only oh, thing left seamless. is the closing. Yeah. yeah. So more of the process that you own in the ecosystem, the better. So if you have a startup. Think about who your exit partner is down the road. Who can we possibly sell this to down the road and why would they want to buy it? And right. then position yourself the same way we did. And I think we just fell into that. Like it wasn't something that we were planning, but when you look back at it, I think it totally made sense, right? It's, oh, they wanted to buy us so bad because of this. And it, it was a strategic move on their part. So what? who is your exit partner? Who would your exit partner be? And then why would they want to buy you? Is it just because you're making money and they want to add to their bottom line or or is it that- What value are you adding to them? Yes, yes, yeah. because they could see you as, hey, look, you guys don't have a lot of money. Like we didn't have a ton of VC money, right? You can't really scale up as quickly as we can help you scale up, right? So your employees are going to be taken care of. We were, the office wasn't awesome before Zillow bought it. Zillow buys it. Next thing you know, we got this Starbucks cafe inside of there. There's snacks for free. There's Powerade and drinks and everything else for free. They put another $4 million into the office. There was a dot loop day. Like it, Mayor Cranley came out and issued I remember a remember that. Yeah, yeah, because they were donating, I think, 25 grand a year or something to some cause in Cincinnati. Plus, they promised to add so many employees every year. So that was a big deal. And then the $4 million upgrade to the building, obviously, which is now they're tearing part of that building down to right. make way for the highway. Yeah. But there's all kinds of stuff that happens. But think about who is your partner? 
And it isn't just about you as this founder. How much money am I going to walk away with? It's, are these employees going to be taken care of too? Yeah. And I know that was a big concern for Austin and for Matt. Are these employees going to be taken care of? And is it going to be better? And that they raise their salaries, all kinds of stuff. You're talking about a West Coast company that these people working for us would be making probably 150 grand in Seattle right. or, or Silicon Valley. They're, they're making 30, 40 grand. It, boom, mm -hmm. boost that up immediately. Keep those good employees around. And yeah. everybody was happy. And some of them walked away with money because it was an all cash deal. And some of them walked away with cash in their hands with their stock options that they had. So it was a good deal all around. And I would say, speaking of VCs, what I'm starting to see more and more is there is going to be, when you're a startup, there's going to be this desire to hold on to as much equity as you possibly can, right? You're always wanting to hold on to your equity. You don't want to bring in a VC because you've heard bad things about VCs, which there are bad horror stories about VCs. So you got to be smart. You got to lawyer up and you got to have a lawyer that's knows what they're doing in the startup world, which we did, but you don't want to get taken advantage of. But at the same time, you need VCs because VCs, as soon as they put that money in there, they want to scale the crap out of your company. And right. they have partnerships that you do not have. And they will be able to introduce you to people that you need to be introduced to. They're going to essentially make you way more money than you. So say you got half the company, you're going to want to keep try to keep half the company as far long as you can, or they're going to kick you off the board at some point. Right. But you want to keep as much equity as you possibly can. But say you've given up 10% of your stock early on, and here comes a VC, they want 25% of the company. But you're like, oh my God, that's crazy. But you're making a million bucks a year now. Oh, they'll ramp you up. You'll be making a hundred million dollars in a couple of years. So that stock, that equity you gave, you held on to, is going to be worth a hell of a lot more if you're working with a good, a much VC. bigger pie, even though yes. your slice is proportionately smaller. If you owned one percent of Facebook right now, you'd be doing all right. Okay, I think you would. Yeah, yeah, you'd be fine. You'd probably have a house in Malibu, and uh, you'd probably surf surfing every day. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's the thing. And but you want to be careful because there are some shady VCs out here, and their goal is to make money. And they do not care. I don't care how they vote. They're in San Francisco. They're voting for being kind and compassionate and all this. But when they work, when they're at work, they're trying to make money. They're about as capitalist as you could possibly get. You just got to be careful. Yeah. No, we've got a great attorney that we're working with here in town. And yeah, I'm, I don't know, man, we're at the beginning of this ride and I'm just excited for it. We'll talk in a year again and see where things are at and then maybe a few more on from there, but. I'm oh excited. yeah. You guys are going to be surprised every, and you'll get depressed. You'll be like, damn, this isn't going anywhere. I'm not getting any momentum. Then all of a sudden something will happen where it's boom next. You guys got a great idea. There's yeah. no reason that shouldn't sell for a billion plus in my opinion. Now that's, Let's it's go. huge. It's a, no, it's huge. It's a huge opportunity for people. And especially investors, if you're you know, looking to put some money into something right now, I look at deals all the time in Cincinnati, I, but I, I like my own deals. Like I, I like sure. investing in myself. I mentor people all the time, and I, I see these deals that these people got, and there's some great ideas, especially coming out of University of Cincinnati. They got some smart kids in there. Yeah, but your thing is bigger than Cincinnati. This is huge, and the it's, fact that you got such a tight niche, and and it can help so many people though. For sure, we're man. Our roadmap is. Um, long and uh, there's so many things we're trying to do. It's just, yeah, I'm excited. So I love hearing the enthusiasm from you who saw us just a few months ago because it's, it's a slog, right? Like I'm doing 12 hour days because oh, yeah. there's still other things I've got to do right now. But mm -hmm. I, I want to shout out to Maher on this. He's phenomenal his leadership on the, the technology side and organizational. And he's just, he's a, a great partner. And we both have agreed many times that we're a great compliment to one another. So yeah, thanks for recognizing him and shout out oh. to Maher. Oh no, no company would be able to do, no technology startup is going to work unless you have a dedicated tech guy. 
that understands it. Turns it. out, yeah. No, yeah, there's no way it's going to work. I don't care if you're investing in companies, that's what you're looking for. It's, oh, wait, you're a tech company and you're two lawyers that founded the company. Neither one of you are tech. Oh, we got a team in India or something. You got to, you need a founder who is a tech person and you then understands it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. You got to have that. And I think a lot of the times people look at, founders and what they've accomplished. When we were do first doing dollar, we were all young. I think Austin was like 18 or 19 or something when he did, <laughs> he bought his first house. And then he wanted to start dot loop at like 21 or something. People thought we were crazy. And then you got these big players in the industry who are looking at us like we're a bunch of kids. How dare you come into this industry right. thinking you're going to change the fax machine and, uh, and, and all that. You're not getting rid of all this paper. Like these kids, they're naive, but look what happened. It worked out. And now that I'm in my forties and you're in your what, late twenties, Stash, you and yeah, my, I'll, I'll be 41 tomorrow, <laughs> 41. There you go. Yeah. So actually the best startup people are, I think there was an age, I think it was 41 or 42 mm -hmm. is the best age to invest in a startup. That's those founders are generally more successful because you're still hungry. Yeah. You're young enough, right? You're still right. hungry, young. And you, you have experience, you've got work, actual work experience and work ethic, and you're willing to put in the time and effort, maybe not as much as a 20 something year old. They've got a lot of energy in there. They don't have much else going on. Right. Well, they don't have kids and a family, no kids and family. Yeah. So that's a thing that kind of knocks it back, but the 40 somethings have a network and you yeah. understand how business works yep. and you understand what's going to work and what's not going to work. So you don't make as many mistakes and you don't put as much energy into things that aren't really going to pan out because you've already seen it. Right. Yeah. So that actually is the, so if you're out there and you're in your late thirties, early forties and think, Oh, it's, I missed the boat. I can't start a company. It's too late for me. No, this is actually, you're actually the people that folks want to invest in. They like seeing these types of people and they're going to probably look at your Myers Briggs. There's some companies over here. I think we talked about on the show. One of the VCs here in Northern Kentucky they won't even talk to you until you take their personality test. Yeah, we went through that. You guys did it? Yeah. Were any of you the personality type they wanted? No. Oh, really? See, you should have called me up. I would have taken the test with you, and then I would have been, because I'm the, one of the, I think, three that they want, the ENTP. Okay. Yeah. But the INTJs, one of my, Austin, I think, is an INTJ. And mm -hmm. I don't know, if, I think he might have done his and told us, but he's an INTJ, which means inter introverted, very focused, right? Yeah. But- they work on one thing and they just crush it, right? And you need that guy. And then I'm the dreamer. So I'm the dude who's, oh, what if we do this? And what if we do that? And then it's yeah. a guy like Matt, who is an ENTJ, I believe, or no, ENFP. He's the one who's, wait a minute, let's just focus on this. Let's bring it in. Let's bring it back. So that combination of people works really well. And when you guys were on my podcast, I was giving you all kinds of ideas. Like, oh man, like as soon as I heard what you guys are, oh, you could be doing this. You could be doing, yep. In my heart, yep. We're, that's, we, we're there. Okay. We, we get it. <laughs> but let's, the tech guy is always the guy who's yeah. just naturally that person. No, I get it. But look, I, it's going to take 150 hours to build that. I don't have time for that. Yeah. So let's build this and start this right. Here's our MVP. Yeah. Now, you, you and I are similar in that way because I'll just go on these tirades. What if we did this and that? And he's like, you can send those to me, but don't flood the whole team with it because they don't know what to do with it. I'm like, yeah, but they should know. He's like, just send it to me and then we'll get it on the roadmap. And I'm like, all right, fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's it. Yeah. I just put it somewhere down a year from now. This is where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this is how much it's going to cost. And this is how much money we can, or th this is how much it's going to cost, which means we have to get this much money from customers, or we have to get some more investment money in order to get that. That's how people plan these things, these improvements that they're going to do. But then also you should hear from customers. You should ask the customer, hey, yeah, or listen to the customer when they just give you unsolicited feedback, because they'll do that too. Sure. Are you yeah. guys at that point with your software where- uh... Yeah, since you and I last saw each other, we started our pilot program. And I think we have, I want to say 15 different user groups on right now, from owners and lenders to brokers, Capstone being one of them, my firm, or the firm that I'm a broker for and with. And we were holding- weekly or bi-weekly user feedback calls. And we got some stuff right away that was like, we need, for instance, we have the ability to move 
groups forward through or opportunities forward through the pipeline, but there was no way to get rid of those that weren't interested. And one of the guys in Charlotte was like, it's almost unusable without that. And then we made the change. He's this tremendous. And he pulled seven different opportunities out within the first two weeks. Wow. That's proof right there. Proof of concept. Wow. Um, That's great. And we're just trying to get it fully buttoned up so that we can go to market. So yeah, I'm excited, man. We <laughs> it's, we're right there. We're at the gate. It's we're, just being held back by the leash a little bit. Yeah. It's, it costs money to do this kind of stuff. The good thing is you are in a, you are in software and software has great margins. So once it gets built and that's the hard part, you got to get it all built, right? Once you get it built, now it's just marketing, really yeah. sales and marketing Yeah, and, and customer service. That's the thing. It's like you, you're going to end up hiring a bunch of people that don't necessarily make you any money, but, but you got to keep have it. Them. They're going to yeah. keep those folks there. Yeah. There's I, a business term for those types of employees. I can't remember what it is, but they don't make you any revenue is essentially what it is. But you have to have them, right? You have to have these customer services. And luckily, you can outsource a lot of that now, mm -hmm. which is a couple one of the people who ran our hiring for our sales team. He actually started, a couple of them have startups from .loop, focused okay. on that and hiring and training sales teams now. And some of them can be wow. remote, like the Philippines. There's a lot of remote sales team people in the Philippines that rock it out and do a hell of a job. There's so, so much stuff has evolved over time with startups. Software yeah. is so much easier to build now than it used to be. You don't need as many people, but you can outsource a lot of stuff. Yeah. It is way easier than it used to be when we started Dotloop. And we had to build, Matt had to build everything in Java. He would have, shit, he probably would have made more money at fifth third just doing Java the whole time instead of doing dot loop, he probably would end up with more money. If he was billing out like 125 an hour, like an agency would have billed at that time. But then right. he also, he bought a, he bought fifth third stock at a buck 50 or something when it took a dump. You remember after 2008? Yeah. And he bought a bunch of that and then he rode that up and he, he sold that and he made some money off of that. So that was a great idea. And I remember we were all sitting in his, in his basement apartment. And he was like, you guys heard of this Bitcoin thing? I think it was like 50 cents a, a coin at the time, right? Yeah. Guys, we should buy some of this. And I, oh, I don't know. It just sounds silly. 50 cents. And now it's what, 34 or $43,000 or something? Just something yeah. massive. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. And it's just, I remember that conversation. We did, if we'd have done that, we would have made more money off than off a of dot loop, probably. I'd have bought 10 bucks worth or something. Now I'd have, or 100 bucks worth or something. It'd been insane. But I yeah. wouldn't have held on to it. But it went up to 10 bucks and I would have sold it or something. Yeah. It was very speculative at the time. What is this thing even? And it's still, I think, figuring it out, but I think it it's is. gained some traction where it's probably got some staying power at this point. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Another thing, too, about uh, startups, we would just saving money, like not putting yourself in a position where your debt to income is insane, right? Or your like, nuts are in a vice. Yeah. Like you go out and you're like, you and the wife, you get married, you're, you know, have a kid or two and you're like, oh, let's go move out to Pied Park or whatever and spend whatever it is, $350, $400 a square foot on a house and overextend ourselves to put our kids in a good school district or whatever in the world it is. If that is you, probably not a good startup person. Like it's just because you're going to come, you're going to hit some hard times. You're going to take money out of your own pocket, put it into the business. It's just, you gotta, you're going to be eating ramen noodles and living like a poor person for a long time. And that's, I still, to this day, we live in a house that my wife bought 10 years ago, $75,000 completely remodeled and over the, in near over the Rhine in Mount Auburn. I don't feel a need to move. We don't have kids. I don't yeah. have to worry about the gunshots that I hear <laughs> weekly, but it's, I can take all this money I'm saving. It was say I moved to Indian Hill. That's what, $20,000 a month for a mortgage? Yeah, probably. But why? Yeah. <laughs> for what? Who am I impressing? Yeah. I'd rather build things. I'd rather, you know, I'm walking around a six bedroom house. Me and my wife. Really like sleep in one bedroom at a time. For what? And then I got a lawn that I got to take care of. What, three, oh four gosh. acres out there? You got to mow. And why? I live in a neighborhood where I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. We just repainted our house, a brick house, pressure washed. Tuck pointed, it needed it after 10 years and, you know, painted it's, you know, 19 or 1890. I think this house was built 1880, 1890. Mm -hmm. Dude, it's like a, the walls are two feet thick. 
We don't, our electric bills barely anything. Our mortgage payments ridiculously cheap. Yeah. We travel. We live in Cincinnati. Like it's so cheap to live here. Like right. I love to go to Florida. Like we got passes to to Universal Studios. We go down there probably once a month, once every two months. We're buying a place in Miami right now, a short term rental, which we could talk about buying those suckers, those condo buildings where you're buying these pre construction condos. You're buying those twenty to thirty percent below market. Really. Oh yeah, you're waiting maybe two or three years for it to get built, but the mm -hmm. whole time it's going up in value. Watch mm. these interest rates drop. What happens to house pr home prices? Yeah, they're going to go up, right? Yeah, we buy this place. It's up. We're up like a hundred percent on it. Wow! And, and, you know, because we bought it at the right time. We bought it during COVID, so it was 2020, the end of 2020 when we bought it. Market at that time was normal. The Miami real estate market's up eighty percent since then. Yeah, Miami really benefited from COVID. Big time. So you got a lot of people moving from New York, some of the more restrictive states moving down to Miami. Not only that, taxes, no state tax. So, and the entirety of South America wants to live in Miami. That's true. Miami does feel like a, a Caribbean or South American city that just happens to be in the United States. I hear more Spanish down there than English, which is awesome to me because I feel yeah. like I'm out of the country. I feel like I'm in a whole different place, but I'm still in America. And the food is delicious. Damn empanadas everywhere. And I'm just like, I need to stop eating those things when I'm down there. And the Cuban coffees are delicious. Yeah. And oh my gosh, it's crazy. Cuban sandwiches. I love Cuban sandwiches. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's so much different culture from all these different places in South America. You got Colombian places, Venezuelan places, Mexican places, Cuban places, Haitian, it's Dominican, it's everything. But anyway, long story short, you buy these things are 20, 30 percent below market when you buy them because they got to incentivize people to buy early. You're going to be sitting there for three years waiting for this thing to get built, depending on when you buy it, right? Mm -hmm. You could buy it when they break ground. You could buy it when they're 50 percent sold. You could buy it whenever. But the earlier you buy it, the more money you, you save, essentially, the more risk you take. Right. But then you're sitting on it for three or four years. The market's going up six to nine percent a year in Miami. Right. By the time the damn thing closes, you got to put 50 percent down. So that's a challenge for most people. You got to put 50 percent down at, in phases. So 10, 10 percent here, 10 percent there, 10 percent over the course of, say, two years. Right. But then when the thing opens up, you're up 50 percent. Yeah. You, you could sell it or. Because it's got a hotel license, the building has a hotel license. You don't have to worry about the rules changing. Okay. So now you rent it out. The Half the building is a hotel. So they manage the unit for you if you want them to because oh, there's sure. hotel units and then there's owner units. Right. And they'll manage it for 25%. And there's an 85% occupancy rate in downtown Miami. Is this in Brickle? We're next to Brickle, downtown. So we're literally right in front of the Port of Miami. So the entrance of the Port of Miami, same street as our building is on, and we're right behind the Cuban Cultural Museum. Mm -hmm. So they're rehabbing that right now, right across from Miami, the whatever it's called now. It used to be American Airlines Arena. I can't remember. Then it was called. FTX, right? Then it was FTX. Now it's something else. But right across from there, so we can walk over to a Miami Heat game. But think about all the people that go on cruises. That's the busiest cruise port in the world. Yeah, it is. We went on a cruise from there. Or what was it, Puerto Rico? Maybe it's Puerto Rico, but same thing. Yeah. And then if somebody rents our place out, we just so happen to be there. Those things rent from two fifty to a thousand dollars, depending on the season, where right. whatever part of the season you're in. What is it, two fifty for a couple to get on a cruise ship? Somebody rents our place out, they pay us five hundred a day. And maybe I have a car that I'm renting out in the parking garage, like a Turo, make two hundred dollars, two hundred fifty dollars a day off of that. Say, hey, you're renting our place, you want to rent our car while you're at it. Yeah, sure. Boom. Now they got a place to stay. They got a car. They're paying me $750 a day. I jump on a cruise ship for $250 a day and I eat for free. And I don't drink, so they can't get me and I don't gamble. <laughs> so I'm just eating up all their food. They're losing money having me on that cruise ship. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm sold. This is my life. This is what I'm trying to do. This is my wife. She says she's entering her soft girl phase, which okay. means that she just wants to be a housewife now. So she owns her own business. Okay, and, and you know how it is owning a business. It's stressful, and she's in the spa industry, so she she does facials all day on mostly upper middle class, wealthier women, and they spill the tea all day with her, and she just hears so many things, almost like a psychologist. Right. Uh, but nice people. All her customers are great people. They come in, they spend the money, and she does really good. She just 
she's not sure if that's what she wants to do now. And then uh, now we're going to get this place. It should open in March, but I love the strategy of it. And I'm going to get my real estate license down there. I've got it in Kentucky. I'm not selling anything up here in Kentucky because I don't really want to waste time doing that selling $200,000 houses when I could go down there and sell million dollar houses. Yeah. So while we're this, it just seems like a great idea. And, and I'm going to tell people about it and on my podcast. And I've been talking about it for the last three years, but when it actually gets going, I want to find out how much it's making, give it a year, see how much money I make off of it. And this, it's a crappy environment to be doing anything uh, like that. But if I can make money this upcoming year, when people are in debt, People still want to go on vacations. They still want to go on cruises. They still want to visit Miami. They still want to go to Art Basel. Yep. They still want to go to some of these music shows and everything that are going on down there. Let's see how much money it makes, right? And then I want to tell people, look, here's how much I bought it for. Here's how much equity I have now. And now here's how much money we're making every year. If somebody's interested, boom, I turn around and help them get a place. That's awesome. I so love that's my it. strategy. That's Once, what I'm going to do when I'm in Miami. Besides yeah, when, dig around the startup world and see what's going on down there. Yeah. Once needle hits, let's help me figure all that out. Dude, you guys should be in Miami. Oh my God. You guys should be raising money in Miami. So many VCs have moved to put their offices down in Miami. They're mm. looking for stuff. And Miami is like the commercial real estate capital. You're yeah. talking about these huge buildings that are going up that are multi-use. So right. our building, for example, has restaurants on the first floor. You've got hotel condos. You've got a spa. You've got a gym. You've got hotels from uh, maybe eight or not, nine, 10, up to floor 23. And then 24 to 51 is all owner units that can be rented out. And the building has, like I said, a hotel license. So you got these multi use buildings that are popping up all over Miami. And you've got stuff like this that you could use to predict possibly. This would be a build for you guys, but rents, looking at all these different factors, how are you going to come up with $250,000? What's your, what, what kind of money can you possibly make and compare this deal to another deal? Like, Hey, I could buy 10 units in this building, or do I buy this hundred unit apartment complex? that looks like crap that's fallen over. And I've got to go in and reposition it and hope my contractors show up. The beauty yeah. of these condos is you're not doing any of that they've already raised the money. They already found a, 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 a spot. They know that people are going to come here. Otherwise they wouldn't be able to raise all this money on their cap stack. That's right. So, and you're not doing it. You're not hitting up contractors to make, they show up, make sure they show up that day. All you're doing is waiting. No, you know? that's awesome. I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I'm going to look up venture capital firms in Miami. Oh my God, you have to. And all these, they're all, they all understand real estate. All the bit, University of uh, Florida, I think, has one of the top, maybe top five real estate schools in the country. And FIU, I believe, has one of the top real estate schools in the country. It's wild. You, it's definitely a place outside of Cincinnati. It's another place that I would definitely be looking at. Yeah. What do you think, what do you think next year is going to bring as far as commercial real estate and VC world and, What's your crystal ball telling you? I will tell you right now that I think I think commercial real estate's in trouble. Office real estate is definitely in trouble. Buildings all around the country in places like DC, uh, San Francisco, New York that are selling for half of what they sold for several years ago. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and these some of these banks are just trying to get them off the books. Some of the uh, owners are handing the keys over. Uh, you saw that with that big mall in San Francisco. Just hand the keys over to the bank. I think you're going to have a lot of problems. Where I see the opportunity is commercial to residential conversions. Sure. And there are some people out there that actually have some algorithms. I can't remember the guy's name, but you could look up a commercial to residential real estate conversion algorithm. And there's a guy who works for a big firm who invented this algorithm that tells you if it's worth converting a commercial building into a residential building. And you actually have that happening in Cincinnati. Yeah, The Macy's building is going to become a residential building. The 580 building has already been a, turned into a, a residential building. Yep. And you've got the Crew Tower that just recently announced that it's going to convert to residential. Yep. I think that's a huge opportunity because you got less people coming to downtown which means less tax dollars for the city. 
because you can't tax people if they're not working those days in the city. So you need people to move down here. We need real estate taxes. We need to convert some of these offices into residential. Now you're getting real estate taxes. The restaurants, the shops, all mm-hmm. that stuff is going to benefit because now you got more people downtown with disposable income probably. And they're going to go into these shops. They're going to spend money. It's just going to make more vibrant downtowns. I think at the end of the day, COVID is going to actually be good for real estate, commercial real estate on the residential side, obviously. It's going to make it more affordable because there's just a lack of inventory right now when it comes to residential. And there's just commercial developers can only build so much right now. And there's a lot of people that want single family homes. They don't want apartments. They just, but then at the same time, millennials aren't having kids. Gen Z isn't even getting married. Yeah. We're having kids. So you're going to have a need for, I think, smaller units with bigger amenities. And I think these conversions are going to be a big deal. And I think the people that are scooping up these commercial buildings now probably have that as their plan. I yeah. think that's where the shift's happening. That seems to be the trend that I'm seeing is just like you said, smaller, maybe living spaces, but tricked out amenities like the clubhouse it uh, is a full-on resort is what it feels like with common areas for studying or working from hashtag work from home or whatever it is yeah you're seeing it in garden style as well as urban infill and then these historic renovations like uh city club here in town they're doing the i forgot about that one yeah central trust building and Jonathan Holtzman, who's the principal over there, he's a visionary when it comes to delivering a really great space for people to live, work, and, and play in. He's he's a client and, and a friend, and <laughs> he's a good guy. I'd love to work with somebody, commercial real estate developer here in town, to build something instead of just apartments. Like we need places people can own. And I think what I have in Miami where they can get in 20 to 30% below market, they wait a couple of years, interest rates come down. I think now is a great time to build something like that. Yeah. Because people can wait it out. They're waiting it out anyway. So why not buy something now, get something below market because people can't afford market prices right now. Pre-sale condos. Yeah. It's interesting because what's interesting to me on that subject is that- Leading up to the great financial crisis, the and I was just getting in to real estate at that time. I got my first real estate license in February of 08. But the trend was condo conversions. So you would buy a garden deal or, or any apartment building or complex, and you would turn it into a rental. I, I'm sorry, you would flip it out into condos. So you'd Basically, the strategy was you'd condo map it and then sell. I don't even know if they were tricking out the units. They must have been. I guess it depends on where the building was. But I think here in Cincinnati, there's a lot of buildings like on the west side that are clearly just apartments that were remnant condo conversion deals. But so that was, I wonder if the banks are still hesitant because it doesn't seem like you can get condo fine financing for condos you can get financing for apartments and multifamily but it takes a lot of teeth pulling so to speak and it's expensive that's the biggest problem to build like so if you want to do like an infill deal here in town with structured parking it's 30 or 40 thousand a space Mm -hmm. just to build the parking and then it's you need some sort of abatement from the city to help make that happen. And so if you're going to do residential, then you might be able to take advantage. Hopefully you're going to be able to take advantage of the residential tax abatement, but if you're going to build it as commercial, so the residential abatement program is a 15 year, hundred percent abatement on improvements. The commercial abatement is 50% abatement roughly for 15 years. And that makes a big difference. Huge difference. Think about this too. We need more hotel space at the same time we need more residential units here. So if you had these flex units, the building had a hotel license. If an event is happening in town, big convention comes into town or whatever, or the World Series or the All-Star Game or whatever, 
these people that own these units could decide to put them on the platform on an Airbnb or whatever. Yeah. Now you just all of a sudden, you've got this multi-use thing where now, hey, I can go stay at a friend's house or my parents' house or whatever for the night, make $250 a night off my unit for the next week, right? Mm -hmm. Every day, boom. Now I got 1000 thousand, twelve hundred bucks in my pocket for renting some of these units. You don't have to build a new hotel. You've got these flex units that people can actually make money off of, pay their mortgages with because these people are coming into town, spending money, and they've got great amenities. You've got restaurants that are going to benefit from it. If I live there, I'm not going to that restaurant every day. But now for the next five days, these people that are staying in my place probably go to one of those restaurants downstairs, probably go to the gym, probably spend some money at the spa. Yeah. So it, the flex units are really interesting to me and these flexible buildings that you can do a lot with people – Millennials and Gen Z, they don't have a lot of money to spend on these houses. Get you a, a two bedroom in one of these buildings, probably cost you 500 grand. Mm -hmm. um, you have to put 50% down generally in Miami. Up here, I don't think you're going to have to do that. I've seen 40%, 30%. I've seen some that are 20%. But if you're planning on turning that into a flex unit, you might even be able to get a DSCR loan. With the DSCR loans, they don't look at your mm. personal income, they look right. at what can this unit make. What right. kind of revenue can this unit make? And they base it on that. And then you don't pay your mortgage. They take your unit. And then the lender funding the building of the project is looking at, okay, what are the pre-sales look like? That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. And now you got flex space. They could be used as hotels. It could be used for a lot of different purposes. Maybe there's a, in Cincinnati, it would make sense to have a smaller convention type of space in there. So you got yeah. people coming into town. They've got a nice little space, maybe a, a 10,000 square foot space or whatever that they could do something in. You have more of those type of type of amenities that make sense for Cincinnati. A lot of the stuff doesn't make sense maybe in Cincinnati that would make sense in Miami. I don't know how right. popular the spa would be here, but right. in Miami, it would kill it. Outdoor pool probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense in Cincinnati. Indoor no. pool, maybe. But you just start doing stuff like that, get a little more creative with what's happening instead of Cincinnati always doing what everybody else does 10 years later. Like, why can't we innovate? Why can't Classic we do stuff that just based on the needs we have? Yeah. So I agree. I like it, man. Let's let's team up and take over the world. Yeah, let's do it, man. We could do it. Why not? Huh? Let's see. We're at about an hour. What else do you want to talk about? You want to talk about your political campaign? Oh, yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. So, so sparked you to want to get into politics? So I've run a couple of times and mm -hmm. full disclosure, I'm a Republican. Economically, I'm just conservative. I think saving money, not getting over your head, not asking people for other stuff. I'm German Catholic. Like we don't ask people for anything. We just we do everything ourselves. And it's annoying when people complain. And, and expect other people to, to me, I just, it just something about it irks me. And I know there's people out here who need help and all this other stuff, but I think we need opportunities. I think we lack opportunities. I think our education system is piss poor, especially in the public school system. Yeah. I went through the public school system in over the Rhine and I grew up in Price Hill, which is two of the, at the time, poorest neighborhoods in all Cincinnati. Did Most you go to the Euler school? No, I didn't go to Euler, but I did volunteer at Euler. And it's just a lot of violence, a lot of cyclical poverty, a lot of people that feel like they need somebody else. They don't have a lot of self-confidence and I hate it. I hate that. I hate that's the mentality. And I hate that there are politicians out there that keep promoting that mentality because honestly, just growing up around people like that and being like that myself, single mom, my dad was a drug addict, alcoholic, didn't support us, zero child support, lived in the woods somewhere in a, a van, like literally. And we just didn't have anything. And we had to figure it all out on our own, which sucked. And luckily, I went to school for the creative performing arts, which kind of put me in a direction. I said, hey, you're good at drawing. You should be going to art. And one thing led to the other. At least I had a direction. I wish there was an entrepreneurial school in Cincinnati, honestly, that taught kids because school is so boring. And they're teaching kids yeah. stuff that we needed back in the days of the Industrial Revolution. Like these kids aren't taught to think. They're taught to work right? Sure. Yeah. They're not taught to innovate. They're taught to memorize things and take tests and be uh, docile little workers. Yeah. And I hate it because it, it hurts our economy. And a lot of people, they get bored. Kids I grew up with, they go into school. They're more worried about getting into a fight after school than they are learning anything. 
Hmm. And nobody cares about school. They're, they don't have a, a future. They don't believe it, that they're learning anything of value. But a lot of them want to be entrepreneurs. You see these kids out here selling drugs. Those kids are entrepreneurs. Sure. Yeah. They're just in the wrong thing. They don't find school interesting. Do you think they're going to go yeah. become mechanical engineers when they graduate? No, yeah. they're just not. And why well, aren't we teaching kids yeah. something that's actually balance a budget? How does a balance sheet work? How does, how does a business work? What's supply and demand? Teach stuff that accounting, doing your taxes, teach yeah. kids stuff that actually matter. Why, why don't I want to work for somebody until I'm 65 years old? Why, why would I want to start a business? And hey, if I don't want to start a business, maybe I want to go work for an entrepreneur in a startup, get some equity. Just stuff that they, – they're just not teaching kids, man, because the teachers aren't doing anything. The teachers are just – and I don't want to crap on teachers. There's a lot of good teachers out there. But they're not entrepreneurs themselves. Yeah, and it's a curriculum. Teachers. Yeah, yeah. there's a curriculum they have to follow. They're told what they need to teach, and that's what they do all day. Mm -hmm. Some of these teachers are out here doing OnlyFans right now to make extra money. Some of them are entrepreneurs. Wait a minute. Some of them actually are entrepreneurs. <laughs> let, me, let me take that back. But building a growth-based business or building something that your community needs, you got Walgreens, CVS pulling out of some of these neighborhoods because they keep getting stolen from. Right. Where are the community leaders? Where are the community entrepreneurs that are going to say, okay, Walgreens, you want to move out? I'll start something. I'll make sure my stuff doesn't get stolen. I'll, I know the kids in the neighborhood that are stealing. I know their mom. I grew up with her. We could be building some of these businesses in these communities, and I just – I can't stand it. I can't stand watching my city to just crime go up. I can't stand the fact that 63% of the city's renters, 63%, wow. which is higher than most cities. Why don't these people own property? Why don't they have an opportunity? Why don't they see that as an opportunity? Why don't we got a Bengals lease deal coming up with the stadium pretty soon? And I think some of our politicians are more concerned with their personal brands and their whatever money they can make. And obviously you've seen it in Cincinnati with some of the bribes and stuff people have taken. And we've had problems with corruption in the city recently. I don't need the money. I'm good. I'll figure it out on my own. I don't need you. I don't need somebody to donate to my campaign that's right. going to have me on the hook for something. Everybody else does. You got a bunch of candidates that don't deserve to run our city. These are people that can't even get a job in the real world. Yeah. They never, or they, you don't see any XPNG people running for county commission, right? They're fine. They're doing their thing. You yeah. see a bunch of people that, uh, honestly, I've met a lot of people. I'm shocked shocked at the people that run our city and run our county when you talk to them. You're like, how does this person get themselves together in the morning? That's how bad it is. And they're running our city and running our county. And then you got this railroad deal, stupidest deal ever in the history of Cincinnati. And they sold an asset they were making a steady income off of that was going to increase by $10 million with a 4% inflation escalator on it. And they just sell this thing for a third of what it's worth. I ran the comps on it. It was crazy. It's like the company that bought it from us just got done selling track for $9 million a mile. And we're going to sell them our track for $4.5 million a mile? It was nuts. It's like when the rail deal, when the railroads do deals between themselves. Yeah. You could, in 2021, just recently, you look at how much they sold them for. They know how much it's worth because they're two railroad companies. Here we are, city of Cincinnati, poverty city just on our hands and knees begging anybody to come in here and buy our stuff to get these clown politicians that put us in these holes out of out, out of the hole to get them off the hook because they've been wasting our money to get votes. Oh, we'll give you free stuff. Who's not going to vote for free stuff? Eventually the bill comes due, right? And then you sell off our assets, which puts us into a deeper hole. So I just can't stand it anymore. It's just, it's a bunch of nonsense. The people that run the city are incapable and I think things need to change. And here I am. You know, I, I'm running businesses. I'm doing stuff. My wife hates the fact that I'm running. She's like, if you get elected, we're going to be stuck here even longer, right? <laughs> we want the flexibility to go places and do stuff. I want to live in London for a year. I want to live in Thailand for a year. I want to do that's what she wants to do. And here I am running for something just because I'm frustrated and I want my city to be better. Oh, I like it. I, I like that you have the passion and, and enthusiasm and you have my support. I appreciate it. I hope yeah. I need uh, 400,000 people to uh, support me on this. 
And it's, I run in this, I do stuff. I run because there's nobody else running, to be honest with you. I ran for state rep in a, in a city that, in a district that was 70%, uh, the other party and the vote came out 30%. I got 30% of the vote. So everybody who was in my party voted for me. Everybody was in the other party voted for that guy, Mm -hmm. but nobody was going to run against him. Mm. And he raised more money than any state rep candidate in the history of the state of Ohio. Wow. So I'm like, well, if I run, he has to spend money. <laughs> Make him spend that money, right? Uh, hey, if you want to run, you want to raise $350,000 for a job that pays $65,000 a year. It's the power that's behind it. That's right. I'm listening to a book that you might like. It's long. It's very long. But it's called The Power Broker. Mm. And it's about a guy named Robert Moses. And he's the one that built like all the parks in New York City. He was the head of the parks for the city and the state, I think, oh, wow. of New York. And it's a very detailed account of his whole life and his dealings, but just it's fascinating. It's a fascinating tale, basically. I don't know. You might like it. I'm reading The 48 Laws of Power also. Have you read that book? <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, that's just a, a master class in narcissism. That book. It really is. It is. But you know what the crazy thing is, is? As I'm reading that book, I'm looking at some of these people that run our city, run our state, run our country. And I'm like, wow, these people are the same people that they're talking about in this book. And I can tell they're using some of these techniques. And these are all techniques that have been used throughout history. They're and timeless. They're timeless. You know? It's real, and you, in order to be at that level, like the federal level, you really do have to be. You have to be a sociopath. You just have to be. To first of all, to believe that you could be the president of the United States, like, how much do you love yourself? <laughs> a lot, yeah. right? Even to run for these smaller positions, you've got some of these people that are running for state government, for school boards, for county government, state government. They think they're these huge power brokers. They just mm -hmm. think that they're they run these things like they're a big deal. It's bro, you're you're county commissioner, man. It's not that it's not that big a deal. Yeah, you, it's not that get, important. They get a little bit of power and they just are you know drunk off of it, so to speak. Off a little bit of power, like it's not even a. And I've done stuff. It's like I don't need it. I don't care anymore. Like I people, they're like, wow, Adam, you were grew up in poverty and you did something with yourself and all this and that. That's cool. Like I'm good with that. Like I'm good with where I'm at right now. I'm good with the what I've got. The investments I've made, the assets that I have, that I, I don't need it. I literally hate every other city besides Cincinnati and Miami now that I got a place there. Like I hate them all. I want them all to lose. I only want us to win. Yeah. And I, Pittsburgh, I don't want any companies to ever move there. I only want to move to Cincinnati. <laughs> if you want to go to, if you want to move to Indianapolis, why? It's flat and lifeless. You want to move to Cincinnati where things are awesome and the geography is cool. And the people are cool. And we actually have a culture. Yeah. Like, what are you doing in Columbus? Columbus is a, it's a strip mall. It's a city. It's a giant strip mall. <laughs> Don't move there. Cleveland's dying. Louisville, why? Nothing. Why? Anywhere in the Midwest. Why would you do it when you could just be in Cincinnati? I agree that Cincinnati is a great town. The best. Yeah. And it's going to get better. And I hate when bad decisions are being made because we're so far ahead of everybody else now. You know why you're running and, and some of these politicians are shooting their horse in the foot, right? They're mm -hmm. shooting them in the hoof while they're winning. They're, they're two lengths ahead and, and they're, let's just keep the momentum going. Why be worse? I can't wait to see all the great things you're going to do. Oh, I love um, it. I can't wait till they debate me. Yeah. So <laughs> if people want to find you or get in touch with you, what's the best way to, to reach out? Oh, just look me up on LinkedIn, Adam Kaler, K O E H L E R. I'm in a, I think I'm in a black shirt with these black rim glasses on Cincinnati. Yeah. You'll see my profile. I think in my profile description, it says County commission candidate or something like that. So look yep. me up on LinkedIn, connect with me, hit me up. If, especially if you're trying to make Cincinnati better or the County, the whole County is I'd be over the whole County, mm -hmm. even Kentucky. I want to work with Kentucky, man. This, we act like we're these two separate places, but we're still, we feed off each other. We need to work. Hamilton County should be working with Kenton, Boone, Campbell. We should all be working together to get projects done. I was at a, a ULI event mm. with, I would carry this book around, Bill Butler from Corporate. Oh, yeah, sure. 
this is a good book to read. It's called Into the Wind, A Journey of an Entrepreneur. And that is one of the things that he brought up specifically was the fractured nature of the Cincinnati region. You've got three counties that border Hamilton County in the city of Cincinnati in Northern Kentucky. And then we also have Indiana. That's part of the MSA. Let, I'm curious to get your take on this, but do you think, so if you look at Indianapolis and if you look at Columbus, those cities generally mirror the county in which they occupy. Do you think that Cincinnati might ever find a way to have a similar layout? I would love to form the state of Cincinnati. Imagine if, look, I, I did, I actually looked it up one time. So you could take the current MSA and add several counties to it, including Dayton. Right, including like Montgomery okay. County and the areas up in Dayton. Cincinnati, this region that we could create, right? Including Northern Kentucky, including part of Indiana, because we were, Ohio was formed by the river, right? They were looking at the borders, they created Ohio. They didn't know in the future we'd have these issues between states. Like, how do we build this bridge? Who pays for it? Who right. owns the Ohio River? All these other crazy things. We are one city, really. People yeah. in Kentucky will say they're not. They want to be Kentucky. But look, what if we just created the, the state of Cincinnati and we combined Kent and Boone, Campbell, uh, Owen County, some of these other counties in, in Ohio and in, in Kentucky, Hamilton County and Butler uh, and some of these other ones, Adams County, even include Dayton in that. And then you go over to Indiana, include three or four of those counties in Indiana. We'd have three and a half million people. Mm -hmm. We'd have more electoral votes than Nevada, the whole entire state of Nevada. Wow. Three and a half million people. And you'd have one regional government. That'd it would be, be like D.C. It would be like D.C. kind of. You yeah. know, it would be like its own thing. And it's it, maybe you could do that to St. Louis too. Maybe you could do it to Kansas City where they, you just turn these like border – these cities that border several states into their own regions. It makes sense because – why deal with all the fuss from how these states were formed 200 years ago? 200, exactly. It does seem silly. It's definitely out of my pay grade. It's but this OKI. They've got that OKI group that's supposed to be like the regional help yeah. make decisions that benefit everybody kind of thing. But it's it really is like its own place. And how much when people ask you about Cincinnati, do you ever say I'm from Ohio? Like no, I you say from I'm from Cincinnati. Yeah, like people in Columbus will be like, oh, I'm from Ohio. Right. People in Cleveland will be like, I'm from Ohio because they identify with the state. People in Cincinnati don't identify with the state. No, because we have three of them here. Exactly. And none of them truly fit. Cincinnati, though, it does seem like it's uh, a northernmost southern city. To totally. Me. Totally. You cross the border. I'm in Covington sitting here right now. I got yeah. a building in Covington. I got real estate in, in Ohio. It's not – to me, it doesn't – it's a neighborhood. To me, Covington is a neighborhood, not a city. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it definitely – we were down there at Kung Food last night. It was yeah. great. Yeah, and now they've got Opal, that new restaurant my buddy's building. That's a great restaurant, that rooftop restaurant there in Covington on Madison. Yeah. It, 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 Cincinnati is just – it's a weird place because it's very southern. You cross that border, and it, the accent changes. Like I've even got a little twang, and it's because I grew up in Price Hill, which is where all the Appalachians live. Yeah. You know, and I'm part of Appalachian and it just comes natural to me to have this twang. But it's, it's southern. Like you cross the border and you're in the south. You yeah. in the north, it's more white collar, things like that. But I like Kentucky. I, I like Kentucky. I like the attitude over here. I like the they look out for each other over here. It's mm -hmm. very kind of small town, old timey. They still got values. It just feels different, man. And then you go to Ohio, it's more fast paced, it's more they don't drink as much bourbon, probably. <laughs> it's very white, more white collar, I would say. Yeah. And it's very northern. It seems more northern, but it's not attached to Ohio at all. So it's like, why do we care if we become like, who cares if we're not part of Ohio? I would argue that the state of Ohio probably takes more money from the city of Cincinnati that benefits the rest of Ohio, but gives us less back than what they take. I guess by that metric, you'd probably have to look at reworking Toledo into Detroit MSA 
And then Pittsburgh would probably take Youngstown. Maybe. Right? Or, yeah. One of those cities that are right there on the edge. Right. Anyone who's a Steeler, like if you're in Ohio and you're a Steeler fan, go ahead and leave. Go ahead and just be. <laughs> Adam is uninviting you. <laughs> yeah, just leave. I, we don't want you. If you're a Steeler fan. Like you're not. No, a that's true. Because I don't think people from Cleveland want St- Steelers fans. I don't no. think anybody except people from Pittsburgh want Steelers fans. Yeah, Steubenville. Steubenville, that's the place. I think there yeah. are mostly Steeler fans up there. I'd rather you be a Cleveland fan, even though Cleveland's doing better than us right now. I'd still rather you be a Cleveland fan than a Steeler. I went to school in Pittsburgh, and I had a big Bengals sticker on the back of my car, and it got broke into twice. I'm a little, I, I don't You're like jaded. It. I'm jaded. I'm jaded. Not day. against people in Pittsburgh. They're actually great people, and they make delicious pizza. Yeah. It's just they've got the weirdest one-way roads up mountains. Like, it's the worst. Really? Yeah, it's the worst. And in snow, it's just bad. Hmm. I've and never also, had the, the pleasure to be in Pittsburgh. But. Pittsburgh's not bad. It's very much Cincinnati. It's like a Cincinnati. You could tell it was huge at one point. Mm-hmm. Like it's a big city. They've got a lot of great arts there. The Melons and the Carnegies and people like that, yeah. they built Pittsburgh. So there's a yeah. lot of really cool stuff there. They got these tunnels under the city that I think Carnegie used to walk through because there was so much soot. He didn't want to get his suits dirty. So he used to go through the tunnels and everything, but very blue collar. Like you could still tell they got more of an East coast attitude. Mm -hmm. They think they're East coast, even though they're not They're They're Cleveland is like that too. Cleveland very much seems like a a Northeastern city does. Yep. Like a Buffalo kind of. Yeah. And Cincinnati's its own thing. And if somebody's listening to this, they're not from Cincinnati, like totally visit Cincinnati. We've got a unique culture. We're not trying to be anybody else. We're not trying to be Southern. We're not trying to be East coast. We're not trying to be Canada, Cleveland. We're not trying to be West Coast. We're literally like, it's weird. It is its own little world. And I would love for for either everybody to start working together or just build the state of Cincinnati and annex everything and just call it the state of Cincinnati or something. Cincinnati's a big town, small city. That's the vibe. Totally. Totally. That's how it feels. Not crazy traffic, but no, there's a lot not. of freaking people here. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like it. You got three million people in this metro area right now, mm, and it just doesn't yeah. really feel like it. No, but it's a crazy idea. But there is actually a a Twitter handle called at State of Cincinnati on Twitter. It's funny. It's hilarious. You got to follow it. I'm gonna look it up. It's just constantly crapping on, and I think several people run it. But it's just constantly crapping on everything that's not Cincinnati. We even got our own food. Like we, everything is unique here. Like you can get. The best worst food in America is in Cincinnati. If you yeah. just want to get fat and just pig out, it's called come to the Cincinnati. state of Cincinnati. Yeah, the I, state of Cincinnati. State of, of, of Cincy. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. It might be that or state of Cincinnati. Look up state of Cincinnati the on Twitter. State of Cincy. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. So yeah, you got to check that out. There's like like a push. Like we feel like we are different. Like, we feel like we're different than everybody else. It doesn't feel like we really fit in with anything. And Cleveland and Columbus, they make fun of us. They call us, they they call us Kentucky. Yeah. And, yeah, and is that do. an insult? I don't get it. Is that an insult? Because Kentucky's nice. Like, what? Kentucky's a beautiful place. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's an insult. I don't, I don't take it as an insult. Parks, they got the largest cave system in the world. The long, yeah, the Mammoth Cave. They got all kinds of, Kentucky's nice. And everybody leaves. What is the deal with people leaving Cincinnati? I want to be an outdoorsy person. Like, I don't, I want to move to Colorado where I can go hiking. You got an entire state below you. You can go hiking in. What are you talking about? Like, we don't have it's any- not a branding issue. Same with even West Virginia, too. I love, West Virginia's awesome. Great outdoors. A friend of mine is building in Snowshoe. He's building ski chalets there. Prefab mm-hmm. ski chalets. Oh, yeah. I love the prefab idea. I want to bring that to Cincinnati too. And yeah. it's hot too when it comes to commercial, not really commercial, but buying land and then partitioning it off, running a uh, plumbing and electrical to it, and then putting in those prefab homes. And, and mm-hmm. it's like a trailer park made up of tiny homes, right? There's a place like that up in like Kings, Kings Mills, mm. right off of just north of Kings Island. I don't remember what that, but you know what I'm talking about right next yeah. to the beach. Yeah, it's yeah, on the yeah. other side of 71, and it's just north of that. And it's like a, it's like a glamping. It luxury, totally. 
yeah. glamping campground. Yeah. I would love it for actual houses. Have you seen some of these uh, European prefab homes? I yeah. saw some out of Latvia and they have Latvian prices and they will ship mm. them to America. My my friend is working with a factory out of Montreal and great. I haven't seen one in person, but from what I can tell, and I, I take his word for it, they're very nice homes. And, and that's the beauty of it. I think you're net even on your construction price, but the advantage that prefab offers is that you get the foundation in and you get the home there and you're up within a day. That's right. Or two days. And then it takes maybe a month to finish, to do the finishes, but instead of six months or a year. And I think that there's less weight, less waste as well. Oh, so, so much less waste. Imagine yeah. if you did that in Kentucky. Imagine buying maybe 50 acres in Kentucky, mm -hmm. building out amenities, parks, things like that, that the community can use a community center, very much a suburban community thing, basketball court, tennis court, or a pickleball court or something like that. And then you build these little smaller ones, maybe for 60 grand, 70 grand, 500 square feet, 600 square feet for like single people. Mm -hmm. And then you are older adults. And then you have two bedrooms, 1500 square feet, whatever that you could build. These things are up in a few days and you could build an entire community. And then they could rent those out if they wanted to. You've got all those amenities, like you said, almost like a glamping thing, but yeah. the flexibility to be able to make your mortgage payment, rent the damn thing out for a week, make your mortgage payment. But I'd love to build something like that, have a little community that's affordable, that people can rent. It's not a trailer park. You don't have that same thing as a trailer park. It's actual like homes with a foundation yeah. and that are nice. I've got some <clears throat> alerts set up for land that just comes on the MLS and you can get some within a reasonable amount of space or distance from the city, you can find some decent pieces of land. You go out to Claremont County and Williamsburg is there. I don't want to, I'll say desperate for housing, but not in a bad way. They want people to be out there and they're willing to be flexible on the terms that they're willing to offer. Yes. Um, and it, you're, and with the revamping of 32 out there, it's going to be much easier to get through that Eastgate section than it previously has been. Oh, yeah. I think any of those kind of places, stuff is crazy, man. People are paying 40 to 70% of their income on housing right now. If you buy a new house, it's crazy. Like, how are people even getting loans for that? You're only supposed to, what is it, 28%? I think is what it is when uh, the way lenders look at it. Like, how are these people paying? This is rent that I'm talking about. People 30, are paying yeah, 30, the rule is like 30%. It 30%, should, yeah. Yeah. And these guys are out here spending 60, 70% on their house. That's crazy to me. Like, I've always been the type of person to be like, how little can I spend on shit and still be happy and still feel like I'm accomplishing stuff? But then also at the same time, like being a cheap ass all the time makes you not get fat and sassy mm -hmm. and lazy. It's if I'm in a nice neighborhood, I'm out walking and things are beautiful and all that. I don't know. I feel like I'll get soft. I need bullets. I need to hear bullets. I need to hear gunshots. I need stuff <laughs> happening, dude. I want to hear police sirens and crap going on. I want to feel like I still got to work. Yeah, I was. So <laughs> this afternoon I was over, I just bought a building in Camp Washington and okay. my neighbor called me and it's vacant right now. I'm working on just securing up the construction loan to get it. It's a shell, but my neighbor was like, they broke in again. And I was like, oh shit. Yep. So somebody had pushed in the back door. And so what's crazy is that I had barricaded it with cinder blocks. These guys stole my cinder blocks. Oh yeah. You can have nothing. You have nothing. No. So I, I bought a house, a crack house on Vine Street off of one of my neighbors. Cause we wanted to buy the lot next to our house, which was a, it was an amazing deal. This guy's the nicest guy. But he sold us, we had a four car concrete parking pad on a city lot, 25 feet wide, 100 feet deep, sold it to us for a thousand bucks. Wow. But I had to buy the crack house on Vine Street. I go wow. around the back of this place, instead of hitting the lock, like there was a lock, a padlock on the side door, right? Instead of doing that, they ripped the back of the house off. Yes, you walked, like you went around the back of the house. And there was the toilet and the sink because they ripped the wall off. 
And that's where the bathroom was. And you just walked in the bathroom door to get in. Sure. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah. Just don't. Yeah. Don't, why hit it with a rock? Dude, with a lock, all you gotta do is hit the damn thing with a rock. It falls off. Right. Yeah. Don't do that. Tear the back of the home off. And then you go in there's heroin needles and yeah. it was all bad dudes. I had to find junk King wouldn't tear it down because the heroin needles, they, they didn't want the kids going in there and cleaning it out. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to clean it out before you tear it down. And this house was unsalvageable. There's nothing I could yep. do. I finally found this old man. He's like 79, 80 years old, brings his daughter and his granddaughter out there for 1500 bucks, cleans the whole damn thing out. There were some hoarders living there mm. and there was this huge freezers and all kinds of crap in there. Heavy, old timey appliances threw them all away. And then just spring construction came out, tore the whole damn thing down. Now it's underground and uh, they took off a bunch of crap and then they buried most of the stuff. But now I got an empty lot on Vine Street that's no longer a crack house. So that's good. You should put a prefab house on it. I was thinking, but the drug dealers all hang out in front of it right now. So that's where all oh. the, the, yeah, that's where all the like weed dealers hang out. But now that weed's illegal in Ohio, they're going to go out of business. Yeah. And so I can, and plus who wants to buy street weed? Like it's going to be laced right? with fentanyl and kill you. Yeah. Get some edibles. Yeah. Get, go to somewhere and get some, yeah. Gummy bears or something, whatever. I like the chocolate that's got the coffee beans in it. It's tremendous. Oh, coffee. Yes. Anything coffee and, and chocolate at the same time. That's my thing, dude. That's my drug of choice. I never drank, never did any drugs and like outside of like just being in Price Hill and everybody's got weed in their house. So yeah. <laughs> outside of those like things, it just never did. And my drug of choice is definitely caffeine. Like I've got a freaking problem with caffeine and uh, delicious Starbucks drinks, which by the way, guys, they are the biggest drug dealers in the world. And the it, biggest bank in the world too. And the great, yeah, dude, I've got money. They got bank, my money in the bank right now on my app. But yeah. it's crazy because sugar is more addictive than cocaine. And caffeine is crazy addictive. Mm -hmm. You just combine like two of the most addictive drugs in the world into a delicious mocha that's laced with calories charge seven dollars for it it's cheaper than drugs <laughs> maybe not i don't know maybe I, it's getting there easy and then you give them your money voluntarily to hold on to while yeah. you want to buy your next drink i'm honestly surprised that starbucks isn't a lender like yes with all the reserves that they have you would think that they would be out being a commercial, there's a company called the Bank Corp, and that's what they do. They aggregate all of the the balances on gift cards, and they lend it out. Yeah, and then they keep yeah. enough liquidity to handle handle whatever reserves are there. But that's what they're doing with, and it's genius. They're they're a bridge lender. Isn't it wild? Yeah. Like it's wild. But it's true. That's how people make their money. And and honestly, my my content credits company that we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing. Because we're going to collect all that money. People pay for articles. The little micro payments they're paying for the articles, and then we pay the publisher. We just reconcile with them at the end of the month. So mm. the whole time we're just holding that money, making interest on it, and then we just pay them one check at the end of the month. Here you go. Here's all the articles. Boom. And here's yep. your report, right? Here's your report. Here's what the articles they purchased. Here's this. Here's that. And then we just hold on to the money. So that's my next thing. But yeah, we'll be doing the same thing. So I can't crap on Starbucks too much for that. But no, it is I'm, a business model. I think it's genius. Yeah, I'm mom. not hating the player. I'm not even hating the game. No, it is what it is. I, at some point, maybe you guys do something with, with Needle that does something similar. You never know. We've got some big goals and aspirations, so I'm excited. I love it, man. Yeah. 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 Well, well let's, let's wrap it up and we'll live to fight another day. Yeah, I will literally talk to you forever. Startups, we're both into real estate. So much to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Adam, thank you so much, my friend. This was a great time. And we'll be in touch. Uh, totally. Thanks. Okay. All right.